Peter, Christian, and Alfred, the EV sector, as the ATFI Green Energy Index shows, is to a large extent being led by Asia and relies on specific technology, like high-end microchips, for example, that increasingly are not global products, but are country-specific ones. High-tech spaces have largely been owned by the U.S. in recent history. But that's not necessarily so now. So, is the development of the EV sector indicative of something much wider? You first, please, Peter. Um, I think so. I, I think the, a- the answer to that is, uh, is, is yes. I think um, while this is a reflection and an implication of the larger macro forces, global regime change forces that we've discussed, um, what you see um, in terms of uh, critical tech for as a general space, um, that is, you know, 10 nano and below, seven and five nano um, chip space, um, you see that kind of critical technology um, also regionalized. So if you if you wanted to capture critical technologies now, um, it would be Japan, South Korea, Germany, United States, somewhat in Britain, and so, and in lesser extent in China currently. And I think you're seeing China moving hard to get into the critical tech space and those very cutting edge um, chip spaces that are required, uh, that will continue to be required both in the EV space and, and particularly in the battery technology to improve efficiency and being able to operate at high voltage. You'll see that uh, critically in edge computing um, and, and, and increasingly um, intelligence, intelligence chips, whether that's robotics, or AI in general. So I think you're, you are seeing um, a regionalization um, of the critical technologies, uh, particularly 10 nano and below. And you've seen that dispersed around the globe in a way that wasn't true before. And you're seeing China try to emerge in that space uh, and compete that in that space with uh, other regions of the world, whether that's Germany or Japan or South Korea or Taiwan, um, and, or the United States, or um, firms um, in the um, in England, uh, etc., or the Netherlands, for that matter. And Christian, what is your perspective? When we were creating those indices, uh, the research has clearly shown exactly what um, what Peter was just alluding to. So you have some sort of a regionalization. We would call it localization from from our point of view that is happening. Um, what was striking uh, for us to see is that, um, and we haven't talked about this yet, um, is in in China and also in, in, in the US, you see much more a verticalization of creating those uh, EV um, um, uh, products or electric vehicles. Um, whereas in Europe, um, there is a very interesting uh, development happening that uh, batteries, for instance, are not included in the verticalization of this whole EV, EV space. So batteries are... Uh, sourced externally. Um, there is a, a very strong push from the EU to also make Europe as some sort of a, a, a battery research place, but um, they have to play catch up pretty much as like uh, China has to play catch up on the semiconductor space. Um, but European car manufacturers have made it pretty clear that they are not uh, considering batteries as an integral part of their um, uh, strategy. So there's a difference here. What we can see between Europe and um, Asia, i.e. China and and the U.S. Alfred, do you have any final thoughts? Yes. So um, semiconductors have been uh, a critical focus area for um, both the Chinese government and the venture capital market for the past 15 or or so years. The the view is that um, it's a critical import replacement. So the government has, um, you know, focused on uh, promoting uh, investment and innovation in this space for for some time in all layers of the stack. So starting from the fab with companies like SMIC, uh, design uh, services, equipment, and the downstream sort of uh, uh, semiconductor design companies. And uh, I I would say that um, you know China has it's been a, a difficult area to keep up, keep pace. I would say with sort of the global innovations, just given sort of the the mass of embedded. Uh, IP and and sort of the the uh, larger application use space of, of the global market. It's been it's not been easy for the Chinese components to keep up, and, and so they've lagged behind, uh, especially in the digital space. I would say the analog and power semi space 
uh, they've uh, been able to to catch up a bit more. And it, it's it's we're yet to see if the in the digital space, uh, if uh, you know, and uh, if the semiconductors um, will be able to keep pace with with the rest of the world. And so there is still a, uh, a reliance on global semis and companies, uh, EV companies are have to stock up um, on these components uh, to ensure that they have uh, continuous uh, supply. Uh, otherwise, their, their production could be disrupted. But in the long term, I think um, this emphasis on um, building a local supply chain uh, uh, will continue. And uh, companies um, and venture capitalists and the equity markets have invested heavily in this, partly because the valuations in, in the local uh, uh, public markets are, are much higher than uh, the, the, the relative comparables around the world. So um, I would say it's not unusual to see uh, a price to earning ratio uh, above the 50, perhaps in, uh, in the 80 times range uh, in the China market for a semiconductor company, which uh, was unheard of in the, in the Western markets. Uh, uh, you know, for, and, and recently, I think semiconductor investing has been more popular in the West. But for a long time, we saw semiconductor companies priced around uh, ten times uh, PE ratio, uh, and, and which so which actually uh, did not attract as much innovation in the West per se. So um, for those reasons, I think uh, China market uh, certainly is has a lot of catch up to play in the semi space, but uh, they are catching up uh, rapidly. Um, uh, due to uh, both uh, government as well as uh, financial uh, motivations.